Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Billy Keels, the host of the Going Long Podcast. Freedom. Every week I'm going to be here interviewing the absolute best in the business as it relates to real asset investing, as well as real Main Street investors. We're going to be having conversations where you can listen in and that's going to help you to continue on your path to education so that you feel much more comfortable as well as confident in investing long distance. So make sure that you, uh, that you go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Make sure that you're liking it as well because that way you can get every single episode as soon as it comes out. And by the way, don't forget to leave today's episode a five-star review. Let's go ahead and listen to today's conversation. Welcome to the Going Long Podcast. We're back once again to continue to help to educate you so that you feel much more comfortable as well as confident investing beyond your backyard. I'm your host, Billy Keels. And if you want to know how to create wealth through investing in real estate long distance, then guess what? Today's a conversation that you're going to want to listen to until the very end last word. You know why? Because today's guest has over 24 years of significant real estate, banking, and private equity transactions as a principal in investing experience. He has also been involved in over $2 billion worth of transactions via acquisitions, management, and financing various multifamily real estate properties. Guess what? He's also a certified CPA and he is the founder as well as president of KRI Partners. Gives me great pleasure to welcome to today's conversation, Mr. Ken Gee. Ken, welcome to the program. Thank you, Billy, for having me. Hey, man, I am uh, I'm super, super excited about this. And, and look, I just have to just talk about this right from the very beginning because they're going to find out where you live. And they all know that I'm a person from Ohio. And guess what? You happen to be from Ohio as well. And so this is kind of what happened. So we love to say OH. I O. There you go. Fantastic. So uh, that's the official welcome here on today's Going Long podcast. So, uh, Ken, listen, no, I, you, you know, this is, this is one of the things I love to do. I love connecting with other people from Ohio. And, and aside from that, you know that I love asking, well, at least I'm going to ask everybody the same five questions. And so, you know, you're going to get two in the beginning. You know, you're going to get three in the very end. And in the middle, it's just really going to, we're going to get an opportunity to know more about you, your experience, and all the different lives that you're positively impacting uh, through long distance investing. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. And I guess the very first question is, and we've kind of already given a little bit of it away, but uh, yeah. where do you live in the United States? Yep. Cleveland, Ohio. All right. Fantastic. So uh, just up north from this guy from Columbus. So uh, and, and fantastic. a devoted Browns fan, unfortunately, sometimes, although we're getting there. We are getting yeah, yeah. there, my friend. Okay, that's fantastic. Well, we all have the Buckeyes in common, I think, is one of those things, we hopefully. Do. <laughs> we do. Yeah, yeah. Um, so here's the other thing. I'd love to get things started off with a positive stint. And mm -hmm. so I'd love for you to share with the Going Long family, Ken, what is the most positive thing that's happened to you in the last 24 hours? Yeah, that's a really good question. So <clears throat> when I when I think about the last 24 hours, I happen to have talked to my daughter last night on the phone. She... Uh, She's down in Lexington, Kentucky. She went to the University of Kentucky and uh, got an internship with a private equity firm down there. Thoroughly loving it. Uh, she got a communications degree. And uh, so through our conversation, you know, I, I, I continue to learn that she really enjoys what she's doing. She's learning so much. And uh, I, don't, I don't know that she could have found a better match uh, for a postgraduate internship. So, you know, that is, in my mind, extremely positive. And it, and it actually comes on the heels of uh, all of our I got uh, two uh, children that are my own and I have a stepdaughter and they're all well on their way to a really nice career learning a lot. And uh, it's just really proud to be a father that uh, is seeing their kids, all the hard work we put in, they put in, seems like it's paying off. So uh, that that's, uh, that's my positive experience. And it's really, really exciting to watch. Well, Ken, thanks so much for sharing that with us. And, and myself as, uh, as a father, I don't still, my kids are still young. And it's one of those things I probably wouldn't have understood before, but when there are just these moments where even my boys are sharing what are the things that they did today when my sons came back from soccer camp and to be able to have those exchanges, see that they are enjoying themselves. And then even to be able to take it to the next level where your, your kids are in school and you're starting to see that they continue to enjoy what they're doing. It, it does give you those proud father moments. So it I sure appreciate does. you, appreciate sure you sharing does. that with us. Yep. And Ken, I tried my best to share probably just a little bit of your story in the beginning in the whatever 10, 15 seconds that I give myself. But I would love for you to share with the entire Going Long family a little bit more about your backstory and also to, if you could help us 
by sharing some of the major inflection points or decisions that you've made to help to get to this point in your journey. And then from there, you and I will pick it up and we'll kind of see where the conversation goes. Sure, sure. So we'll stick to my professional life here. I, I grew up in Toledo, went to University of Toledo, got my undergrad in finance. And at that time, I met my uh, first wife and uh, moved to Cleveland and went to work for a bank and then pursued my graduate degree at night. And one of the key mm-hmm. Uh, elements of that particular program was an assessment class that helped you figure out what you want to do when you grow up, figure out what your skills are and what do they need to do to add to those skills. Well, I learned, I went there for an MBA and left with a master's in accounting because I thought I wanted to be an accountant. So I had a, I was a commercial lender for a while. Then I went to Deloitte, was a CPA for seven years, spent, spent all my time in the tax side, did a lot of M&A work, did a lot of private equity work, due diligence, transaction structure planning, really exciting stuff. But in both of those careers, one thing kept showing its head. And that was when I was a lender, all of my clients, all of my customers had significant real estate portfolios and they were doing very, very well. Then I went to Deloitte and that particular office, the Cleveland office had a massive Cleveland, uh, a real estate practice in, in, in that office. And here again, tons of clients doing extremely well in the real estate world. And I said, you know what? It, I I need to do this. This is something I need to do. So I spent a year and a half because I'm really careful, very deliberate about just about everything I do, just trying to network, joined the apartment association, went to every class I could find, got to know the people that were presenting and really developed a network, right? Which a lot of people should do when they're starting out. I did that in 1997, took, took the leap and bought my first 28 unit apartment building in a small part of Cleveland called Shaker Square. And, uh, and, and then the rest is history, right? I continue to just slowly add on to that. Um, we, we typically aren't long-term holders. We usually buy at our value and sell. So, mm-hmm. you know, through that process, uh, I uh, learned that this can really be something that becomes my own. And it, gives, it gave me an ability to build a business that uh, to now that I look back on it is really, really cool. So, in, uh, in, I think it was 01, I decided to make the jump, bought a flight school, crazy, crazy jump right before 9-11, mm-hmm. run that for a couple of years, still doing real estate on the side, realized, what am I doing? Real estate is where I need to be. Real estate's where I continue to do well. I need to commit my life to this. And from that point on, uh, we, we've been owning and managing apartments here in, in, the, in Northeast Ohio. Now we've kind of, about 10 or 15 years ago, we made the switch to Florida just because of, of the economics, the, the demand supply situation. And so now we're, we're down there and that's where we've been for the last 10 or 15 years. Really, uh, really having fun growing and developing what we have and uh, making it uh, a viable business that's doing quite well. So a viable business is doing quite well. You started um, in, in Toledo. You got, wanted to get your MBA. You did this assessment and, um, and you ended up with your, with your accounting degree, but you, and you kind of went through some things and, and definitely want to pick up, but mm-hmm. you kind of said this one thing and just kind of rolled over. It. And I, I hope that the going long family picked up on it. You said that you bought a flight school. <laughs> so yeah. I just want to make sure number one, that I did hear you properly. You and did. number two, if you were going down the real estate path, what in the world, what caught your attention about yeah. owning a flight school? That, that's a great question. At the time, real estate wasn't significant enough to pay the bills. So mm. I, I actually, no, this is an even crazier story. I learned to fly while I was working at Deloitte. Deloitte's offices were downtown in, in one of the big office buildings. Burke Lake Front Airport is literally a five minute drive away. So <sighs> None of my colleagues knew it, but at lunchtime, I would get in my car, drive over to the airport, go do my flight lesson, come back and finish my day as a CPA, right? I mean, that's not what you would expect a CPA to do on his lunch break. So no. what I learned was this this particular business, I felt it was run by a pilot. I felt it could be run so much better. I felt that people wanted to do this, but they didn't want to do it in airplanes that were so old they had shag carpet in them right? Makes mm-hmm. sense. Yeah. So I said, you know what, this, this is a business that's not being run right. I bought the business, flipped over all the airplanes, turned them into brand new Cessnas. And the, the even through 9-11, that company grew and was very successful. We grew it to three locations. Uh, 
We ran a part 141 school, which is basically a professional pilot training program. And we became part of the Delta connection. We were sending pilots up to up through the Delta connection system. So I thought it was a business that I could, uh, well, make that leap from working for someone else to working for myself. And that was the key here. I, I would, that's what I was looking for. I was looking for that opportunity. And then uh, three years later, I ended up selling the business. And at that time we had continued to slowly grow our real estate. And it was at the point where real estate could then support me. And that's, that's kind of how, uh, how I got there. It's a pretty unusual turn of events, but I saw just such an opportunity to turn that business around. That's why I bought it. And so this is what I, but part of what, was it the combination of number one, this was something that you were doing in your spare time on your lunch break, flying around with. So there was a natural, you had a desire to continue to do that because it was something that you liked. And and was it also the combination of your uh, accounting background that you started seeing that there were, there was potential to improve also yeah. for like, was that maybe talk us through that? Cause I, yeah, that's well, I, I thought the business, um, they had one new airplane, which everybody wanted to fly. Mm -hmm. And all kinds of old airplanes, which mm -hmm. y y if you know much about airplanes, you, you don't want to see shag carpet in your airplane. You, you just uh, don't. No. So yeah, from no. a, <laughs> you just don't. You, you know that thing is old. So from a business perspective, I felt there was tremendous upside there, and mm -hmm. so I bought it because, yes, I enjoyed flying. I don't actually fly anymore because I just don't. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to run it as a business. It just happened to be a flight school. And we developed multiple sources of revenue for that company and ended up selling it. So it was truly a business opportunity. And that's how I always looked at it. And I was right. Okay. And so you were right. You saw that business opportunity. I want to put a pin in that just for a quick second, because I have a feeling that we're going to be able to probably bring that to something else that you're doing, that you're uh, doing very, very well, you and your team, uh, I should say. So one of the things that happened for me, and the, and the Go Long family will know this, Ken, is... I, I read this book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad and like a lot of people. And so it ch impacted my life. I don't come from a family that we didn't know there was no real estate involved or anything like that. But by the way, do you, do you have um, family members that were involved in real estate or anything? My mom happened to work for a guy that owned apartments, but <clears throat> excuse me, I was too young to really understand what it was. I, I did get my first job at an apartment building, rock hounding uh, a okay. property he was building. I don't know if you know what rock hounding is, but no, it's what, what getting is a that? yard break and raking all the rocks out of the dirt, oh, shoveling wow. them into a wheelbarrow and then taking them over to the pile of rocks and dumping them. Dumping well, this them. was a 200 plus unit property, very large. Wow. And at the age of 14, that was really hard work, but I was getting three bucks an hour and I felt rich. All right. It had well, nothing to do with why I did real estate. It just happens to be, there's a little bit of a connection there, but Okay. So that's, that's, so not, a, that's so there's, appropriate to it. Okay. So there's a little bit of connection. And, um, and so one of the things that happened when I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I happened to live in Barcelona, Spain, like everybody knows. And I started looking at the things that I was learning from the book. And I, then I started reading a bunch of other books, right? It wasn't just Rich Dad, Poor Dad, but that was the one that kind of started it. And I read all these books and all these books said, you know, be the, you know, you're going to buy your property. You want to be able to check on it. You want to look at the square, you know, how much it costs per square foot and this and that, and make sure you maximize the rents, drive down the operating costs, get to your NOI and just be able to get to two to $300 a door. Right. Mm -hmm. Is what I was understanding and in, in, in being able to be the landlord. What I didn't actually realize is that living in Spain, I was in the type of market. I wasn't sophisticated enough at the time to understand that that was really being in an appreciation based market. Right. And so it was going to be difficult to make cash flow, which is what I was interested in. And so uh, w one thing led to the next. And eventually I just decided to purchase a property, but the first property I purchased was about 5,000 miles away. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that happened in my mind was, Hey, listen, you don't actually have to buy a property in your backyard. You don't have to be the landlord, right. but that's really, it, it's kind of unconventional because the majority of the books say get into real estate and it, at least when you're getting started and you want to be the landlord. And mm -hmm. so I'm always curious, right? Because the, the, one of the genesis or, or the thesis for this whole podcast is you, we want people to feel comfortable investing and be comfortable and confident investing beyond their backyard. So I, I love being able to ask my guest and Ken, since today you're kind of in the hot seat, why in the world would you decide to invest anywhere but beyond your backyard? Because you just talked about building your company even in Florida. Mm -hmm. So 
here's what I, one of the many things I love about real estate, and that is that you can do it wherever supply and demand and the economic picture stacks up, right? We pick, we're currently in central and northern Florida, and it's, it's, it's very deliberate reason, demand and supply. People are moving to Florida like crazy. The supply of what we buy, BC class properties, they don't, they're not building them because they can't. So when you have increasing demand, stable supply, you're going to have upward pressure on rents, right? Yep. Then when you actually buy properties and make them more valuable because you fix them up, you make them nicer, you raise rents. Now you're putting a value add strategy on top of basically a bull market. You're going to go crazy, the returns. So why w- why did I go to Florida? Because the economic picture made sense for me to do it there. And then I slowly developed our team in those markets very slowly. And Mm -hmm. because everything I do is very deliberate. And so now, you know, that we're vertically integrated. Now you don't have to be vertically integrated in order to do this. I mean, we do third party management and people, you know, we've got people, our clients, some are Seattle, California, Canada, they're from everywhere Mm -hmm. doing the very same thing. They're just, they've just selected us to manage their properties. So, you know, they're going to, they're going to do quite well because I take the same best practices that we use on our own property and use it on theirs. So there's lots of ways to go about doing what you did. I think you know, the first one you bought was relatively small, which is probably harder to get a property management company. So if you yes. stick to the larger properties, it's easy to bring a company in like us and manage that asset for you. You're absolutely correct. Getting larger properties, it's much, it's it's much better conversation to be able to bring in qualified professionals to manage the property. But because you're, my brain and many people think on a much smaller scale until you do it, mm-hmm. if I could go and start over again, it would just be able to bring the people that I know, like, and trust, bring them together. And then we would buy a business, right? Buy a business That's- because at the end of the day, real estate is a functioning business when purchased and operated properly. That's exactly right. right. Yep. And so I want to now kind of take the pin out of what we put in earlier because I figured we would go to come down this path. So- when you, so now you're constantly like part of your model is you're being able to purchase something where you know that you can add operational efficiencies and you can make it better. You talk, you use the word value add. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just curious kind of what that experience that you had with and the recognition of that airline or the, the flight company that you purchased and having had that success and being able to exit, how that lends itself or lent itself in the beginning to getting started in the real estate and being able to, in the real estate business and also being able to replicate that success? Yeah, that's a good question. And there is a really good connection. It wasn't necessarily as deliberate at the time, but when I think about, I I think about all of my background and bring it together, I'll bring the flight school into it. Mm -hmm. Being a CPA helps me understand numbers, helps me understand accounting because it's a business. Being a commercial lender, you've got to understand how lenders think because you're using them for 70% of your capital stack. Now, The flight school, three different airport locations, means it's a decentralized company. Being a part 141 school, and and think about it, you're in charge of someone's life, right? If you don't properly maintain your airplanes and you don't do the right things, people are going to die. So the part 141 school was constantly being surveilled by the FAA. That's what they do. They're supposed to inspect our, our business, our procedures, our flight instructors, our airplanes, all of those things. So it required me to really systematize and build systems that worked without me involved in them. Now, this is critical because you said correctly, apartments, they're just a business. A flight school is a business. Any of your listeners probably are running a business. Just so happens that we run apartments. They need the same system. So what the airline or the aviation business taught me was, why do planes not fall out of the sky? Because pilots use checklists. Why do they use checklists? Because they know what to do because they know they're going to forget something. They also build into that a review process and they build into their systems redundancy because they know something physically is going to fail and they need a backup system. So I took those concepts and put them into the apartment world. It's, It's very operationally focused, which is why we're vertically integrated. That's part of the reason we're so successful for ourselves as well as our clients, because as we continue to grow our company, we have all the systems in place to support that growth. If you shoot to the moon, and don't take the time to develop those systems, you're, it's going to fail. 
It just will. I see it happen all the time. So that's the connection. That's what re- That's the big value that that part of my life brought into what I'm doing right now. And so b- being able to see the things that you are doing now, the successes that you're having, able to replicate that and then p- base it on a foundation of, as you mentioned before, you, you there was this desire of something that you would love doing, which is flying. You had this background, which was uh, accounting. And then since then, you've been able to also, as you had experience with lending, then that helped you. And then there's this operational efficiencies as well mm-hmm. that has helped you to get to the decision, which was getting to a company that's vertically integrated. What would you say is the, because we've talked about companies that decide to be vertically integrated, meaning that not only are they owning the property, but they're also um, managing the day-to-day operations or the property management, some would say. Mm -hmm. But I have two questions. How would you define vertical integration just so our going along family understands it? from Yeah, in our business, I, I define it loosely as we manage the properties that we own. It's that simple because yeah. it it's about execution, right? When you buy, you have a plan. It's a financial purchase, but somebody has to execute this business plan. And because I know and understand the systems that we've developed, I feel very comfortable that our execution is going to be good. Perfect. And so this is, so then knowing that your execution is going to be very good, and I would probably even go beyond that because you, you strike me as someone who's a, a very humble person person. So I'm going to guess they're probably getting closer to great, but that's just me. Um, I I guess what what I would, what I would ask Ken, because I know a lot of people, as you begin to build your portfolio, you make decisions that say, okay, well, listen, I want to continue to grow the number of doors that I have, but I don't actually want to manage the day-to-day. So I'm going to work with someone who's a competent um, property management company. But what would you say is the single greatest advantage to making the decision to be vertically integrated, meaning that you manage your own properties. Uh, the fact, what's the single advantage that I have? Because yeah. I know the execution and I don't have to worry about, is it going to get done the way I think it should be done? Right? Yeah. Because when you hire That's, a property management company, you're hiring someone to run your business, all of right. it. Right. And if you, you just want to make sure that their business plan, their way of doing business matches up with what you think is the right way. And as long as they do, then, then you should hire them to run yeah. your property. And so when you, when you talk about execution, and I'll take it from the, a lot of, of our going long family who are either watching us on video, and of course you should be watching us on the video. And if you're running on the treadmill, then you, you have that option. And if you're doing something else, well, then just keep listening to us. But one way or the other, I think, Ken, what you're also saying from the edu- execution is if you're looking to maximize the amount of control that you have operationally, this is one of the ways that you would want to at least consider um, mm-hmm. is, is the vertical integration. It, it is. Now, the other fair? thing that I will tell you, with our clients, we're pretty flexible. With th- some clients, they don't want to know anything. Just send me reports and that's it. Other clients, they manage themselves in their local jurisdiction, but they know they can't manage from 2,000 miles away or whatever it is. So we allow them to be involved at whatever level they think is appropriate. Yep. And I think that's important for your listeners to understand that most property management companies should have some level of flexibility. I mean, you can't drive them nuts, every, you know, and yeah. be on the ground every day. But you want, I, I, my view is you own the property, the buck stops with you. If you want to be more involved, we'll always give you our honest opinion as to what we think we should do. We'll tell you what we're doing and why. Yeah. And if you're the kind of person that wants to sort of sign off on decision, that's totally fine with me. I absolutely think that's a great idea. So I think your listeners should take away that you can have different kinds of relationships with property management companies. You don't just turn it over to them and wish them the best of luck. That is not how I would do it. Yeah. And so I love that you, that you kind of drilled down on that point, because one of the things that we want to help people feel comfortable and confident doing is investing beyond their backyard. And typically, whether there is someone who wants to maintain, and I say control, meaning that they want to lead or be much more active, maybe in certain markets. And then in other locations, they want to be more passive or they may just want to have a certain um, asset in their portfolio, but they don't it doesn't make sense for them to try to manage that because it's in a different location. So once again, it's also about understanding what is the specific 
um, what is the specific goal or objective that you have for each of your acquisitions or each of the assets that, is, or that are in your portfolio? And if it's something that you're looking to have high control over for whatever reason, then as Ken's talking about, maybe being vertically integrated because the property is large enough or whatever that you're there. But if you're looking at something and maybe it's a smaller type of asset, maybe it's not 300 units, it's uh, 75, 80 units. Maybe it doesn't make sense for you to be vertically integrated there. And so you would want to look at using a different tool, which would be working with highly competent world-class operators in, in that in that regard. Would that would that be that is that is, yeah. So you can certainly engage a third-party management company. Another way to do it, which um we'll talk about this hopefully in a minute, but one of the things that I have long argued that most people, they have really good day jobs. And they should really be passively investing in real estate. Yeah. So you're going to want to look at the same things that you would look as a as a property management company to, to passively invest with someone. So consider that as an option because it is a very good option for, for many people, if not most. Definitely. So yes. So let's get into that. So there's a couple of different ways people can do that. You can joint venture with people. You can syndicate with people now. And I think we were talking about this a little bit before I personally choose to syndicate working with accredited investors. You can work Mm -hmm. with the sophisticated investors as well. Um, And because here we have lots of IT sales professionals, we have lots of pharmaceutical sales professionals, and we have lots of telco professionals that tend to listen to us and participate and things like that. And I'm also one of these people, I I still do that. And so I I like my day job. Mm -hmm. I I just happen to love this whole syndication thing and being able to connect with other people. I know it's something that you love to do. And so I would love for you to kind of give us your, um, yeah, give us your, 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 your input as it relates to syndication. We, we know that we love it. We'd love to hear from you and also how you are approaching um, the, the syndication to be able to add value to others. Sure. So we're, let, let me just parse a couple of the words here. The first is syndicators. Syndicators typically go out, find the deal, and then they go and raise the money if they're able to lock up the deal. Yeah. Um, that we we have done that. Now we're focused on the on the fund, the blind pool funds, and the reason we are is because markets like Florida are extraordinarily competitive. Most of the buyers are syndicators, so if gotcha. you can have a fund and have the equity pre raised. That's really important because now you have an advantage over any syndicator. So that that would be the first distinction I would well, make. And, and I was just going to say, so Ken, this is, this is great because I've not really broken down funds for people and because typically people are thinking about a raise for a particular property. Mm-hmm. You just mentioned the fund. There, are as a, there can be a lot to it, but if you could help people understand when you say a fund, what do you mean by that? And also how that can be a, a, a benefit for uh, an investor. Sure. So the the benefits of a fund are that typically a fund is formed for multiple acquisitions. Um, The investors, they're called, the the generic term is a blind pool fund. And it's because the investors, there's there's no deals in the fund yet, typically. So you find a, a very experienced fund manager like ourselves, right? We've been doing this for 24 years. You look at the types of deals that we've done in the past, you would look and say, okay, I like this business plan. It seems like they know what they're doing. You want to make sure you do all your due diligence, right? We'll talk about due diligence in a minute. So now the benefit that you get is that you're going to have the potential to be in multiple deals in that same fund, right? You don't have to put all your money in one deal and hope it works out, right? You kind of get a little diversification there. It could be geographic. It could be it, it could be size of the deals. It could be all sorts of things, but it gives you that opportunity to have some diversification and to probably get a little better returns because the fund manager is generally more experienced than a syndicator. Sellers generally know that that takes the equity raise risk off the table because when we approach a seller, they know we've already got the money. We don't need to go raise it. So they know that chance of not closing because of an equity problem, it's gone. So we get better deals and they really enjoy working with us for all of those reasons. So there are lots of good reasons to do that. Now, some people that are used to syndications, like syndications because they got they want to look at the numbers. They want to underwrite it themselves and see if the sponsor is really right and see if they agree with all the assumptions. In a fund environment, you lose sort of that ability. What you're doing is you're investing in that fund manager, right? Very similar to investing in a mutual fund. It's no different, right? You don't know exactly what stocks he's going to buy tomorrow, 
but you know that he's a good manager and you trust that he's probably going to pick or, or do his best to make good decisions. It's kind of the same way. In, and, you, and, and, you're usually gonna, and you're usually going to get more tax benefits in your type of fund than the one that you would get on the, on the market. Correct? On the mutual fund. Yeah. <laughs> on the mutual fund. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Which, which is, Typically which is a big deal for me. And yeah, all those exactly. depreciation benefits, all that stuff flows through to the individual investors. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. Which is, which is great. And so and what I love about the way that you frame things, Ken, is once again, we're, we're back to helping each individual understand what is the right tool to use at the particular point in time, right? Because what, what we're helping people to see here is that there's no one right way or wrong way. It's a matter of, you just talked about also too, if somebody's looking for a specific syndication, then they want to be able to go line by line. And maybe there are people that want to actually do that. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it goes back to a thing of control. Whereas what you're talking about now is if you know that you want to be able to get tax benefits, you know that you are comfortable with the particular fund manager, the fund, because you'll generally get a direction of where they want to go. And you talked about it could be this certain type of asset in a certain geographic situ- area, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. But they're just, it depends on what is it that you want to be able to do as, inve- as an investor and understand the different options that you have available. And one of the things that I know you can help us a lot with here as, a, as an experienced, um, not just a fund manager, but as an experienced business owner, uh, an operator, you talked about due diligence, right? And this is one of the things that it's key, right? It's just, it's absolutely key for yeah. understanding the probability of success that you can have as an investor. Talk us through at a high level, Ken, because you could, we could talk about this for days, of course, we could. but in terms of due diligence, what should someone be looking for, or maybe even a couple questions that they should be asking when sure. they go through their due diligence, when they're looking to place capital? Got it. So when we're done here, I'm going to talk about uh, an ebook that I wrote that awesome. couldn't be more on point. So let, let number one, I want investors to look for experience. Please don't invest with the person who has not done it before because you're taking on much, much more risk than you know, because these are businesses. They have risks that need to be mitigated. They have things that are going to happen. Think about the pandemic in 2019. Who would have thought <clears throat> that the apartment industry would be dealing with a pandemic. I mean, there's things that are going to happen to a business. And what's important is that you have a senior management team running that investment that you know can put that investment in the best position possible because they have experience. They went through 2008, 2009. They've gone through you know multiple real estate cycles. They've gone now through a pandemic and done well. Those are experience, number one. Number two, you're going to want to look at people's track record. Now, I'll, I'll talk about a site that I think everybody should look at. It's called Veravest is the name of the company. They're in the U.S. One of the things that this market is missing is a good way to vet sponsors, syndicators in this space. It just, there, there's not anybody that's there until Veravest came into the picture. Veravest, let me tell you what we did with them. I love the concept that somebody is vetting us. We had to send them 23 years of tax returns, settlement statements, operating statements. I mean, you name it. They did a full background check and they monitor all of our investments going forward. So they have all of our operating agreements. When we do something, when we distribute money, they're checking, they're verifying. That's hence the word verifest. That's how they got their name. They're monitoring us so that when people want to know What's KRI's track record? They can go to verivest.com. They can find us on that site and they can see they're a little, we, they literally ticked off every sale price, every hold period, all the returns, everything, right? That I'm not, I, I'm kind of their poster child because I believe in the concept. I don't think there's anyone else doing it. They do a remarkable service for this industry because especially you're, you're in Spain. How are you going to vet me? That's going to be very difficult. Well, you go to Veravest and they've already done it for you. Now, it was very expensive for us to go through that process, but I think that level of transparency is critical. So now that leads me to a track record. So when you go to our site, our page on Veravest's site, you'll see our track record, literally every deal. And they actually look for deals that people didn't share with them. Okay. Think about that, right? Mm-hmm. If you if you tanked a deal, just don't tell anybody about it, right? Wrong. They have ways to to find find those deals, right? So super valuable, I think. So experience, track record, and uh, and then just make sure you talk to uh, the sponsor. Make sure 
you you make them explain what they do, how they do it, but more importantly, why they do it. Yeah. Why? So if you were to vet me and have a conversation about our fund, I could tell you exactly why we do BC class assets, why we buy in Florida, why we do our renovations this way, why that's so critical. Because as you know, when you, when you ask someone to explain to you why they're doing it, it's going to be really obvious whether they know and understand what they're doing. And that's super critical because that's what you're doing. Even with a syndication, you're still investing in that syndicator and their ability to run that business going forward. So those are the so, three things I would recommend. Yeah. And so I, I love that you, so not only talk about the experience track record, you've given us a, a very specific a, a website that you can go to, Veravest. I, I like the concept of what it is that they do. And I guess I would just on behalf of the entire like, Going Long family, because that's what I'm here to do is ask questions on on their behalf, is if you could share like, what is one of the, it's probably the, one of the best questions that you've ever heard from someone. And, and like, again, I, as I say, we, we have probably have a lot of people here that are probably earning somewhere between, I don't know, $250,000, $400,000 a year and probably have, you know, I don't, uh, let's say four or $500,000 sitting in the bank. that's not doing anything aside from their other investments. And they're thinking, mm-hmm. I've been listening. This sounds actually kind of cool, but I just have always done the stock market. And this is, well, this is, I feel more comfortable there, even though the roller coaster is taking me up and down, up and down. At least it gives me something to talk to people about. <laughs> right. um, but what Ken is talking about, this whole concept of asking, getting in touch with your, uh, with the manager or with the syndicator, or whoever it is, depending on what you're looking for. What's like one of the questions that you thought, wow, that's a really good question from this person. And you know what, this is the question I think I want everybody should probably ask that is in this kind of a profile. Yeah, there's a, there's a number of them. The, uh, the, probably the best questions you can ask are... Uh, very specific ones, right? Remember, mm-hmm. I want to get to the whys. And yep. the reason I want you to get to the whys is because, you know, if I go to my kids and say, hey, do you understand this? Are you ready for the test? Yes. Okay, let's go over a question. Tell me why that is. I, I don't know, dad. I just know that's what the answer is. Oh, time out. That means you don't know. Okay. I uh, use that same concept in this business. So Ken, why do you not renovate the moment you take over a property? Why do you want to wait 30 or 60 days? There's a very specific reason, right? So drill into those details. Tell me exactly how you do your renovations and what do you look for? That is, see, the more specific the questions you can raise, the more detail you're forcing that person into, which if if they're at some point, it's going to become obvious to you. Oh, wait a minute. This guy, he's not, he's, he has not been there, done that. In terms of, I mean, I can, there's probably a hundred questions. I mean, I get them every day and I love them because they really uh, are important. Yeah. And I know you'll be able to, to, to help us a bit more, but, and one of the things, and and I'd love to just get your take on this before we get into the going long final three, because Mm -hmm. I can't believe the conversations go so fast. It's just amazing. Well, one of the things that I, that we talk to people about is, is listen, when you're speaking to someone, make sure that that person can answer the question in the way that you need to understand it. Because if you're considering placing two or $300,000 of your capital, regardless of what percentage it is, it should be a, a smaller percentage, right? Just to not still money. To get started. It's, it's, it's still money. money. It's it, yep. correct. So you are, you're, you're there, you're, you're getting ready to take this action, but you have to get the answers to the questions that make you feel comfortable that you understand because I've, I've, I've spoken That's to so many key. people Ken, is that they're like, well, I didn't feel comfortable asking the question. And I said, well, you're, you're, you're going to place $300,000, like get the answer in the way that you need to understand it. Cause it doesn't do, I, I, I just, I'm curious what your thought is on that because I'm, I'm kind of passionate about it because I hear so many people say that and I'm just very adamant about that. Yeah. So one of the reasons I talk about this Vera vest uh, is because they ask a lot of the tough questions. They're, they're not here to make friends. They're here to right. just put it out there. This is what these guys do. This is what they have done. I can't, the, the reason I think that's important is because people who are, that I talk to every day about investing in our funds, I can tell that some of them, they're hesitant. They they want to be polite. They right. don't know where's that line that they shouldn't cross. Right. They're worried about being 
difficult or intrusive or I don't, you can use any word you want, but yeah. they're concerned. They don't know what right. is appropriate. They may or may not. Now, other people, they're very comfortable with it. And I, I don't mind that. I get very concerned when I get the feeling that someone didn't understand the answer to the question, but they passed anyway. Yeah. Because what I don't want, right? We're here for the long haul. I don't want you in our deal if you don't really, truly understand really what's going to happen. Because yeah. only one thing's going to happen. At some point, it's not going to go the way you thought it did. Correct. And it wasn't because somebody did something wrong. It's just that you didn't understand. So my number one piece of advice is, <clears throat> if you don't understand what they just said, ask them to explain it another way. Don't be shy because it's it's your money, right? Who's Correct. responsible for your money? You are. Yeah. So make sure that you know exactly what's going on and so that you can make the best decision. Don't just worry about it. And I see people do it all the time. I mean, it, it's crazy what people do without a proper vetting. I think it's it's dangerous. And that's why I like the fact that there's somebody looking over our shoulder. Yeah. And I, and I appreciate you saying that. And also one of the things that, and correct me here, Ken, if I'm wrong, but one of the things that also Ken and I are saying is make sure that you get the answer from the person that you're talking to. And when we say the person, meaning the team, like some, if it's not that individual that you're talking to, someone on the team that you're investing with has to be able to answer the question in the way that you understand and makes you clear on the concept. Whether or not you agree with that, that's something else, but at least someone on that team needs to be able to answer the question so that you understand it. A absolutely right. Remember, if you're not comfortable, <clears throat> don't give me your money. Exactly. End of story. And to, just move on to the next one. Because oh, there's somebody out there who will take the time to make you understand. Correct. And and if they're not, then they're probably, well, you're not with the right team. So um, speaking of moving on, so I don't want to move on at all, Ken, because like I said, I want to keep talking. <laughs> I know I'm that the going long yeah, I, I know like the going long family is like, I just want to keep talking, keep talking, guys. <laughs> this is all, this is great. This is a lot of fun. But the thing is, we have to get to the going long final three. Sure. And the thing is, Ken, I never ask any of our guests, any of the going long final three, unless they tell me that they're ready for me to ask. So Ken, are you ready? I'm ready. Ah, you were born ready. I knew you'd be ready. I knew you'd be ready. All right. Well, I won't hit you. I won't hit you, but I'm ready to go now. Here we go. All right. Here's the first of the going long final three. We started with you in that wonderful state of Ohio. And I want to bring it back to this side of the pond, right? Where I am now here in Europe. And so I always want to know, like, I would love for you to share with us, like, what is your favorite European city that you've either visited or is still on your bucket list to visit? Yeah. So Truth be told, I've never been to Europe. Not I want yet. to go. Not yet. Not, Not yet. yet. I will. I will. Um, I think uh, of all the cities I've thought about, I think Italy would be really interesting for a lot of different reasons, um, just culture and what have you. Uh, my daughter was actually supposed to go to Italy just before the pandemic. It got canceled. She was crushed. She really, really wanted to go. And so uh, we, uh, we will do the whole tour through Europe. Um, but I'm especially interested in seeing Italy. All right. So check out Italy, which is, which is great. I would highly recommend that. Well, I shouldn't say this cause I used to live in Italy, so I'll, I'll keep my, I'll keep it to myself. Yes. Italy is, is fantastic. Go from North to South, which would be great. And I'll keep myself out of trouble there. Um, <laughs> there so, and so, and here's the other thing, Ken. So question number two really has to do with success and successful people. And one of the things that I've noticed and whether you call them mistakes or um, learning opportunities or however, whatever kind of, uh, twist you put on it. Sure. Like one of the things about successful people is they're really successful people because they typically have only made one mistake in their entire life. And the fact that they've only made one, it, well, I keep getting that wrong. I get that, like literally I get that wrong every single time. I think it's kind of by design, Ken. Actually, yes, it is by design. But in all seriousness, the thing that happens, we all make mistakes. Yep. And the thing is, successful people probably make a lot more mistakes or have more learning opportunities than anybody. Like, but the one thing that I have noticed that really successful people do differently is when they make those multiple mistakes, have those multiple learning experiences or opportunities, they take a moment to learn a lesson. And the lesson they then put into action the next time. Mm -hmm. And I would love for you, as someone who's very successful, you've probably had loads of learning experiences. Oh, I've had lots of learning experiences. Yeah. <laughs> what, what is one 
of those learning experiences, but most importantly, what is the lesson, the one lesson that you would think, sure. wow, this for the going long family, this would be really important to know. What would that one lesson yeah. be? Yeah. So I'm, I'm actually going to give you two quick. One is going to be a really deep dive into a real estate. It's our business, right? Remember mm -hmm. I talked about, ask them how they renovate, right? Mm -hmm. I made the mistake once of buying a deal, jumping right in, implementing that renovation plan, you know, everything to the wall, full pedal to the metal, let's go, let's get it done. Here's the problem. When you run a property for 30 or 60 days, you learn things you didn't know before. Even though you did a really good job on due diligence, sellers don't tell you everything. So sit on your hands for 30 or 60 days, figure out, okay, now that I know even more about this property, should I make a change to my plans? Yes or no? Do I need to reallocate some of those funds? That's the biggest real estate mistake I've made. And that was a long time ago, but that's mm -hmm. why I always want our clients and we sit on our hands for a minute when we buy an asset. So we make sure that we're doing the right things because mm -hmm. capital is scarce and you don't want to have to call more capital because you screwed up and you didn't realize this needed to get done. That's, yeah. that's not a good way to deal with your investors. Now from yeah. a much higher level, I would say, and it, it's it's something, it's my best advice for people in terms of working on your plan. There are times in my life when I get a little sidetracked, right? You, you start this plan. I have this lifelong plan. This is what I'm going to do. But during the during that process, you kind of get down this tangent and down that side road. Keep yourself focused on your plan. Mm -hmm. If there's ever an overall mistake I've made, it's when I've allowed myself to wander off that plan because you get going in directions that you shouldn't be going in. And mm -hmm. then I recognize that and pull myself back. So I know you asked for one, but those are two, because I think they're important. One specifically to real estate mm -hmm. and the other one's really just to my life in general that that I uh, I think was worth sharing. So you avoid, avoid the shiny shiny object syndrome, stay according, stay on course. This is probably from your um, flight days, but stay on course. And uh, the plan is the plan. And you know, I've, I, this, I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's very solid uh, advice and solid lesson that you're passing forward to us, which is, which is something that is greatly appreciated. And also too, just one thing, cause you mentioned just kind of wait 30, 60 days as it relates to the real estate thing. Yep. I want people to understand that also what you're saying is you're not saying wait and don't do anything. You have oh, a right. plan, you, you have a plan and it is, you, you know, you want, as you said, stay the course, but there's what you're saying is, within that plan, you give yourself 30 to 60 days to be able to adjust. Don't just get started. Is that, would that be it accurate is, just to is, clarify? It is. Yeah, absolutely. So I tell, one of the things I see people do is when they set this plan in place and they talk to their investors about it and they feel like they can't change the plan because right. if they do, their investors will think they don't know what they're doing. Right. Wrong answer. We look at the, we have a plan when we write an LOI, we've changed the plan when we do due diligence. We change the plan again after we buy the property and we're constantly reevaluating that, right? That's yep. management's job is to change because the environment is changing. changing. So yeah. don't be afraid. I, I see so many people said, I, I'm going to paint it purple because I told my investor I was going to paint it purple. Well, purple might not be the right. You, now you might want to paint it pink, right? Well, then paint it pink if that's the right thing to do. Your investors will understand and respect your reasoning as long as you have a good reason. They'll respect that. They won't think that you don't know what you're doing just because you changed some portion of the plan. I say it's actually a huge injustice to do that to your investors, to stick rigidly to a plan that may no longer might not make perfect sense. Yeah, you have to give yourself a little bit of a uh, space to to maneuver Agreed. a little bit. So, okay, perfect. Yep. And then here we get to the going long, the last of the going long final three, Ken. And it is really about how do we help to feed our brains? And I would love for you to share with the going long family, what is one book that you would recommend to us? Yeah, it's, uh, there's a guy, you probably heard of him, Grant Cardone. He, Once or he twice, has yeah. a whole 10X concept. Um, I particular so I read that book. I've, re, I've I've listened to the book. I've read the book. I, I do a read and, and hear from Grant a lot in terms of what he does. But the reason it really resonates with me is, you know, I grew up in a small Toledo, Ohio, mm -hmm. in an eight hundred and some square foot single story ranch house, and mm -hmm. uh, I was not a member of a country club. I didn't have all these rich friends. I didn't I didn't have any of what a lot of people might have to get them started. So yeah. every, you know, he is all about 
Um, you just got to grit it out, just get down to get down to work, get it done, no excuses. And I really relate to that because mm-hmm. the more I stay focused on that type of mentality uh, and the more people do that, the more successful they are. So I really enjoy that book. And if you haven't read that book, it's it's really a no nonsense. Just just do it. You got to get it done kind of a book. Yeah, we'll get uh, we'll get 10x up there. And it is really about being able to understand, hone in and drive the right activity and just do a lot of it. The results will 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 begin to to yep. to follow. And then you want to make sure that you're staying on course. And if you need to move a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right, well, just adapt and keep driving that activity. So, yep. uh, Ken, look, I, I like but the thing is, it's I love these conversations. They just go by so fast. I mean, it's just amazing. All the things we're talking about from you and in Toledo and doing the finance and written and, and, and as I would say, raking, uh, raking the rocks and then dumping the rock rocks hounding, and getting yes. a lot of what would you say again? Rock hounding. Rock hounding. There you go. Rock hounding. Yeah. I'm going to remind my kids. I'm going to make uh, maybe <laughs> make that's rock what we'll, do. Don't we'll do that. be doing that's rock tough. hounding and stuff like that now. We'll, that's tough I'll work. be out there with them. No, but I mean, just from being able to get started and then from there, you understood that you wanted to be able to get your MBA. But guess what? You gave yourself the opportunity to pivot a bit and then you decided to go for your accounting degree. And then once you were there, you were in these meetings with the big firms like Deloitte and you were watching people from the other side of the table and you thought to yourself, well, hang on a second these transactions seem to be pretty uh, interesting and they seem to be doing what they're like doing. And guess what? I see a common denominator and it's real estate. And so then at a certain point you decided you wanted to like leave that world, start your own world. And so you bought a flight school, which I think is pretty cool. But more importantly, you saw this opportunity to take something that was, was working okay, but you saw that there, you could kind of shine it and make it even better. And after three years, you were able to exit that. And then from there you decided, wow, you know what? You wanted to get back into the real estate and you wanted to begin to to build and you started to build and you started to then go long because not only were you in Ohio, but you saw this opportunity in the state of Florida. Mm-hmm. You recognized not only that you were doing things well, you were continuing to replicate this model and you wanted to have more control because as you executed, you recognized that not only were you doing it pretty darn good or greatly for yourself, you even were able to attract other people to say, hey, listen, if you need this kind of property management uh, a part of your portfolio. We can do that for you. And you've built a business that's gone long. You continue to bring a wealth of experience. You've given us amazing examples today. And I know that there are so many people that are part of the going long family. They're like, Ken is really cool. I want to know more about him. I want to know more about what KRI partners are doing. And so help us understand, Ken, what is the best way for the going long family to find out more about you and what, uh, what you have going on at KRI partners? Yeah. So the best way, uh, go to kripartners.com. Now, remember, I told you I, I I wanted to share with your listeners. Go to KRI. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. So one thing really quickly. So if you are only listening to us, this is your chance to go to the video version because you're going to see something really cool in just a couple quick seconds. So go ahead, Ken. Sorry, you okay, have this sure, cool thing sure. you want to show us. So go to kripartners.com slash ebook. Now, the reason I said this is going to be particularly interesting to your to your listeners I wrote this book myself. I write everything we do like that myself because I think that's important. It really covers two topics. Topic number one is the number one question that every single person who wants to do real estate has to face. They know there's a ton of money to be made. How are they going to put themselves into that process? So I help them go through that decision of should I buy a duplex? Should I buy four families? Should I buy an apartment building? Should I invest with someone? What kind of real estate should I buy? Should it be medical? Should it be uh, triple net lease, what should I do? So I go through that whole process. Now, at the end of that process, I think most people, because they have day jobs and, and so on and so forth, they should really be passively investing in real estate. So that takes me to part two of the book. And that is, how do you vet sponsors like us? There's a whole bunch of questions in there. I give you some insights as to how this business works. Because if you understand how we do things and why we do things and and what makes us successful and what we try to avoid, it will help you understand how you fit in that process. And it helps you understand what motivates uh, people in our business. And I think that's important, right? Inside knowledge is super valuable. At least I think so. So it's kripartners.com slash ebook. And then of course, if you want to reach out to me directly, you can just email me at kg at kripartners.com. Or call our office, 813-489-9666. But if you know the side of the pond, you may just want to shoot me an email and I'd have love to have a, a Zoom call with you just like this. 
All right. Fantastic. And one of my mentors always says, if you want better answers, you have to ask better questions. And so when you can have someone that has the experience that you have, Ken, and not just uh, from the acquisitions, but lending and also just the accounting point of view, operational excellence, and you have insight to the questions that you have asked or have been asked multiple times, you're giving everyone an opportunity to continue to ask better questions so that they get better answers, which ultimately when you want to place your capital, uh, it's something that is really, really important. So Ken, man, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for investing time with me and the entire Going Long family. It's been very, very, very uh, educational and, and entertaining. So thank you very much. Well, thank you for having me. I've really had fun. All right. Fantastic. And Ken, if you give me just a couple seconds, just want to say some closing words to the, to the Going Long family. Going Long family, I'm going to make this quick. Ken just left so much value, gave you some really actionable items that you can put into place today. He's even given you the option to pick up his ebook that he's written himself, take you down two paths to help you get clear on what it is that you want to be able to do. You're going to ask better questions. You're going to get better answers. And you know that when you're listening today that you know at least two or three other people that need to hear today's conversation. Ken was amazing. Take your phone out of your pocket for a second and just share today's episode. Two or three people, you know who they are. They're right at the top of your mind. So go ahead and share that. And since you have your phone out already, if you could do us a favor and also leave an honest written review, an honest written review and rating. And let us know because I go through each and every one of these and continue to take in your feedback so that we continue to make sure that the content that we deliver here is most relevant for you so that you're able to move forward much faster. So just a couple seconds, an honest written review and a rating would be greatly appreciated. And listen, I'm really looking forward to welcoming you back for the very next conversation. So until then, go out and make it a great day. And thank you very much. Wow, don't you love hearing from top-notch experts in the field? You know, when I was getting started, I really wish that I would have had access to such experts. And even more, I wish they would have given me like a really simple list of things to follow so that I could have gotten to my goals much faster and been much happier even sooner. So that's why I've created for you the seven things that you should avoid in order to be successful in long distance investing. And you can pick that up really easily by going to billykeels.com forward slash seven things to avoid. And also, if you liked today's episode, don't forget to leave a five-star review. I'm looking forward to seeing you on our very next episode. So go out and make it a great day.